Uh, okay. Um, welcome everyone to the uh, Pinterest Labs uh, Distinguished uh, Speaker Series. Uh, my name is Yuri Leskovets and I'm a Chief Scientist at Pinterest. Um, and today um, we are super excited to kick off the 2021 with an um, amazingly uh, cool uh, talk and um, speaker. Uh, so today I'm happy to present uh, Sanya Fiedler, who's an Associate Professor uh, at the Department of Computer Science at the University of Toronto. Um, perhaps even more importantly, um, she's from Slovenia and I'm also from Slovenia, so we got our undergrad degrees uh, at the same uh, cool place. Um, so, Sanya's uh, research uh, lies at the intersection of computer vision, uh, graphics uh, and NLP. Um, uh, previously, she was a, a professor at uh, TTI uh, Chicago, um, did her postdoc uh, at uh, UC Berkeley, uh, and is also currently uh, taking the role of director of AI at uh, NVIDIA, uh, leading the research lab uh, in Toronto. Um, she received uh, a number of different awards from uh, NVIDIA Pioneer Award, uh, Amazon um, Academic Research uh, Award, Facebook Faculty Award, um, as well as the Canadian CIFAR uh, AI Chair. Um, she's, I think, also one of the founding members of the Vector uh, Institute uh, in Toronto. Um, and her work also uh, received um, best paper awards at uh, various places. Um, so I'm uh, really excited for uh, the talk today. And uh, Sanya is going to talk to us about uh, computer vision, data labeling, and how AI can help us to get uh, better data. Um, so um, thanks a lot for coming. Uh, the protocol is that uh, uh, Sanya will give the talk. Uh, you can ask questions uh, in the chat. The talk will last about 45 minutes, uh, and then I'll moderate the Q&A session at the end of the talk. Uh, so uh, thank you, Sanya. The floor is yours. Well, uh, Jure, um, yeah, I'm super excited to be here. Uh, you know, as Jure said, we, we come from, from long back. All right, let me try to uh, share my screen. All right, you guys see this? Uh, yes. Yes. Uh, yes. Perfect. Oh, good. Yeah. All right. Great. I have per perhaps a little bit of an unusual title, but you know, we're going to talk about how AI can actually produce data that is going to be used for AI and kind of like a recurring loop. Um, like you said, I have two sides of me and really the work I'm going to talk about today is um, both from my UFT lab as well as NVIDIA lab and it's all thanks to these brilliant students. I have uh, 20 students in my UFT lab, uh, 16 people uh, in my NVIDIA lab and uh, yeah, I'm going to make the talk kind of be in two different parts, um, tackling kind of the work in, in, in two of my sides. All right, great. So, you know, AI today is, is amazing, right? And we know that at the heart of AI lies deep learning and, you know, it's making all these amazing uh, applications possible from robotics, you know, self-driving cars, uh, medical robots, to image search, machine translation, you know, beauty related applications, chatbots, um, you know, a lot of the stuff is possible today to a really uh, uh, useful level. You know, some part of that um, success has been to just this kind of uh, um, software like Cafe, PyTorch, and has really made it uh, uh, machine learning more democratized so people can really quickly get up to speed and build their own applications. Um, but really what, what powers deep learning is, is data, right? Without, without data, there is no learning. There is no data-driven learning. And things are changing, but a lot of this, you know, high uh, performance applications actually need labeled data. All right, what does that mean? So if I have, um, you know, images taken from a driving platform or aerial images, indoor robots or whatever. So any kind of images uh, or any kind of applications, I, the first thing I need to do is somehow understand uh, the world, understand what's, what's in these pictures, right? So kind of get some sort of segmentation of different objects and be able to tell what these objects are. Okay, this is a standard task in computer vision. Even if you're not a fan of computer vision and you just want to synthesize beautifully looking images, segmentation is still key. Um, because for example, in the recent work, 
Um, you can take a semantic layout, it's called, but it's basically it's a segmentation mask and people can all generate like super photorealistic images and uh, with kind of different styles and so on. So really segmentation uh, is one task that is very commonly used in different applications. All right. The issue is that label data typically needs people to provide ground truth and segmentation in particular is very time consuming. Um, if, you know, one annotator would spend maybe one minute per object, right? So if I have a very complicated scene that can take up to an hour, if not longer. All right, for something like medical imaging, this is even worse because now I need doctors to actually go and take volumes, which is actually a stack of images and annotate them with labels. So it's really not the best uh, employment of their time. Um, so in my U of T lab, we have been working on, you know, how can we actually introduce AI into the data, um, data, lab, data labeling process? So how can we actually make data set creation uh, much more efficient? Uh, and a lot of our research is kind of uh, around that. Um, all right, so basically, what does that mean? We want to create some sort of AI assisted annotation. And we have really been putting all of our methods in uh, this, you know, software called Toronto Notation Suite, which we're going to release very soon. Um, where basically what we want to enable is, you know, annotator is going to select an object and we want to have automatic prediction, obviously. But since we're, there are going to be mistakes, maybe enable interaction, interactive correction, uh, we're also powered by AI. We want to have a tool that actually works across very different domains because you never know who the user on the platform is going to be. Right. I could be labeling street images. I could be labeling faces and we kind of need to anticipate any kind of user. Um, and of course, because AI is going to be powering this tool, we can actually have something that trains as your label. So you can have this kind of incremental improvement. Uh, the more time you spend on the platform, hopefully the faster you're going to be able to label. That's kind of the wish list. And it all started with this uh, paper that we did in 2017. Um, where the idea was super simple. So, you know, the annotator would kind of be cropping out the object and we had, you know, this kind of CNN, RNN architecture, which would uh, be producing vertices that would outline the object. So, you know, first you would produce the first vertex and then this would be an RNN. So you would produce the next vertex, the next vertex, and it was just an RNN that was basically decoding the polygon outlining the object. Um, why this is nice is because really how annotators annotate objects is with polygons. So it's a really natural representation uh, to be outputting. And the nice thing about this kind of model was that, you know, whenever you, the model makes a mistake, the user can potentially just, you know, drag and drop the vertex into a correct position. And then hopefully, you know, your model kind of uh, gets up to speed and corrects from that point on onwards. So that was 2017, so now this is already four years ago. And since we have tons of different methods, um, both from improving this kind of contour prediction to 3D annotation, to video annotation, um, to data search, data search as in machine learning data search that's gonna be most useful for application domain and so on. I'm not gonna go into details of these methods. I think if you guys have questions in the end, we can talk about it. Um, but today I really kind of wanted to, to do a demo just to see whether this is um, or how useful this is. Um, let me let me try to do that. Do you see my screen? Yes, hopefully. All right, so here I have some image um, and, and now you know this tool allows you to select the object you want to annotate so in this case this. And then you have some additional functionality that is AI powered as well. So I can maybe refine this um, and I can maybe make some small corrections and hopefully the AI gets it. Um, we can try to do some other thing, maybe something like that. And here there's basically nothing to fix. And you know, um, this, this tool basically allows you to upload your own imagery, kind of compose your own set of annotation tools you're going to be needing, both for classification, because I have classification AI powered, um, as well as segmentation. Maybe we can try another one. Let's try to annotate this guy. And there's different tools as well. Like I could actually just draw like a rough, rough contour around this guy. All right, so it basically took me no time. And then we're hoping that the AI is going to 
quickly pick this up and correct. Maybe I have a couple of errors here and with just a click, I can correct this. The nice thing about this is really the, the generalization. I can be selecting maybe like medical domain, you know, um, here like a doctor or some tool. And, you know, there's some errors here. I can just drag and drop and I can very quickly correct this. So this is almost done. There you go. Maybe some refinement. And that's it. And you can do medical images, you can do aerial images. So the tool is really kind of gen generic. Um, maybe I'm not gonna do the entire demo over here, but let's, let's maybe select a lung as well, since this is a popular item. I don't know which one, it's in here. And this was trained on natural images. The fact that it even kind of tries to do a lung here, it's, it's a miracle because we know that neural nets really overfit particular domains. And this is done. So typically, you know, you get like three times, if not more speed up, right? This would take me a minute or maybe a little, little bit less to annotate, but now we can do this much faster. Um, cool. All right. Maybe I'll go back here. And maybe in the end, if someone has a wish for another image, you can send it to me in email. We can annotate it after the talk. Um, all right. So this is going to go out in March. We're going to do a release, uh, we're just trying to finalize uh, maybe with Amazon to get some credits to actually run this because it's all GPU powered. We also have an accompanying phone app where all these methods are actually running on the phone as well. I'm just going to show a quick demo here. Um, so one application that is not just, just for machine learning data here, you can actually use it for marking objects. Um, which might be useful for fun things, right? Um, adding, add, adding some some special effects to your imagery. Cool. So I think the phone app will make it really accessible to a wide audience um, because everyone that is bored has a phone and can just be playing and clicking a bunch of things and getting some annotations out. All right, great. Um, so the second part of my talk is going to be about 3D content. So the first one was about images and, and getting labeled uh, images. The second part is going to be around 3D content, how we can actually use 3D content, uh, as well as how can we actually help create better 3D content. All right, so 3D content is, is key in a lot of different applications, right? So architecture, you know, everyone is using computer graphics and uh, designing in this software to, uh, to actually visualize before you go out and build things in gaming in film, uh, in film, right? All the characters are CG because there's no way that you know, a bear can actually do what the directors want them to do. Um, VR, AR, um, as well as robotics, right? So in robotics, which is particularly what I'm excited about, it's mainly used for simulation. Right, so if I have a self-driving car or a you know, medical robot that's gonna be operating, you actually need to test uh, the, the, the robot in simulation before you can go out and release it in the real world. Right? Uh, this, is, this is a safety critical application. So let me just play this video for a driving simulator. Right, so simulation is great because it gives you the control over the environment. Um, basically, you can decide, uh, um, you know, whether you're going to be urban or highway, how many lanes, the density of traffic, um, the scenarios you're going to test against, how difficult those are going to be. You can randomize, you know, weather, traffic signs, um, make it as easy or difficult as, as you wish. The, another nice aspect of simulation is that it also renders ground truth. All that labeling we were talking about before where someone needs to go and actually do it manually, it comes out for free from a, basically just a graphics engine. You just render it the same as you render images, you render ground truth, right? Because everything is already annotated in 3D. Uh, so you could potentially use it for training as well as a way to synthesize training data. Cool. Now. The issue with simulation, same as before, is that it actually 
even harder to create a content for simulation. So let me play this video where we ask the Manual artist to, to match the, the real image effort. above here. Here, we see a person creating a scene aligned with a given real-world image. The artist places scene elements, edits their poses, textures, as well as scene or global properties, such as weather, lighting, camera position. This process ended up taking four hours for this particular scene. Yeah, so here we asked the artist to recreate this image that was taken from a car. And the assumption was we already have assets, you know, where you can pull them off of the data marketplace, the turbo squid or something. And the goal was just to reproduce it. And that already took five hours, right? So it's a really complicated task. Now, you know, if you want to have huge worlds where you're going to be simulating your, uh, your, your traffic or whatever for the for training the ego vehicle, that just becomes like a huge engineering effort, right? In fact, uh, many of you might have played a Grand Theft Auto game. Um, that took three years by a thousand people. Um, maybe not all of them were engineers, but it was a huge, um, huge pool of engineers and artists basically going around LA and taking tons of photographs and kind of taking that footage and trying to replicate LA in, in, in a synthetic world. All right, so this is basically where we can come in, right? This is a computer vision problem, right? Taking photos of a world and trying to reproduce it in, in 3D. So this is really kind of my goal uh, at NVIDIA. So um, I want to create, I want to create AI that's going to be useful for 3D content creation in kind of all parts of the pipeline. And there are a couple of components that I think are super necessary. Right, so we need to be able to synthesize worlds, which means uh, just scene layout, how the ob objects are composing into a scene where the cars are, where the traffic signs are, or indoors, you know, where the sofas are and so on, as well as create the actual assets, uh, you know, the, uh, an actual 3D sofa or actually some, some asset like that, right? That takes a lot of time. And then there's a time aspect, right? Uh, which I'm calling here scenario, which means uh, behavior, how are these cars or how are these people behaving inside a simulated world? And then also how you're animating them. That also needs to look realistic. Okay. So all this stuff right now is all done by some rules, by some hard work by artists or engineers. And the question is, can we actually use AI um, to speed up all, all these um, layers of the process? Okay. So I'm going to tackle each of these problems individually and just show you a little bit about what we've already done. By no means is this exhaustive, it's just kind of our humble beginnings in this topic. Okay, so the first goal is going to be, we just want to take some footage, and in this case from autonomous vehicles, but you know, it could be pictures from the indoor scenes or whatever. And we want to turn them into synthetic worlds. We want to turn them into worlds that look like that footage. Maybe not exactly a replica, but at least, you know, if I'm in Toronto, I want to see more brick buildings and the density of cars, the number of lanes should be matching what I see. Um, so that's kind of the goal. All right, and we're going to turn to how people actually do this in games. And in games, to have this kind of scalable world creation, people use probabilistic grammars for procedural models, right? So if I wanted to synthesize something like a, like a street scene, I would have a road, I would sample how many lanes, and then on each lane, I'm gonna sample how many cars, and maybe I sample a sidewalk, whether I have it or not, and put a bunch of people on, on the sidewalk, right? So basically, someone goes and encodes the rules of how the world is being generated, how the world is being composed, okay? This is pretty easy to define. Yes, you can make it as complicated as you wish with all sorts of different assets added, but in principle, this is um, an easy, easy enough task. Okay, so essentially a sample from this probabilistic grammar is going to look like a, like a tree or maybe a graph, right, um, where the nodes are going to have a class, meaning this is the class of the asset I need to place, and then of course attributes. Attribute meaning location, maybe orientation, height, pose, color, whatever kind of defines that asset and allows me to place it in the world. Okay, so here would be one example of just kind of randomly sampling from, uh, from some procedural grammar. Okay, now here is where I start to need to be careful. 
right? It might not be hard to say, I always need to sample five cars or some density of cars, but really how to define all the distributions for the attributes might become trickier and trickier as soon as these grammars become larger and larger, right? So the artist needs to go and actually say, okay, this is going to be this in the distribution, such that the cars are gonna be roughly aligned with the lanes and you know, people needs to be in this kind of locations and, and viewpoints and so on. So you can see that as the grammar becomes more complicated, this can actually become more and more complicated, right? Plus, if I'm now in a different part of the world, now I need to go and, you know, kind of fine tune all these distributions by hand again. Okay, so our first task here, our first goal was, can we actually take these rules, can we take this structure to be given, meaning that uh, we're going to trust that the number of cars, number of lanes, and so on, comes from a distribution that was well designed, which might be an easier task, um, but learn the distribution for the attributes. Okay, and we want to do that without any labels of the downstream data, because that's really the best case scenario. If we don't need anyone to label anything, then, you know, we just feed in footage that we record, which is very easy to get, and, and the words are being composed uh, automatically. Okay, so what we're going to do here is take this procedural uh, model or publicity grammar and, and sample trees sample some some scene graphs, if you will, um, which basically tells us how many cars, how many lanes we have. And now we're going to encode this with some graph neural net, because this is essentially a graph. And we're going to try to repredict the attributes for each of the nodes, meaning that we don't necessarily trust how the car was placed. So we want to repredict its position and maybe other properties. Um, such that once you render that scene graph, with this transform properties, the rendered image is going to look like that real footage we have collected. Okay, so basically the goal here is we're trying to train this graph neural net that's trying to transform the attributes of this original sample scene graph, such as renderings look like the real images. Okay, and we want to do that in distribution. So we're going to take a batch of real images, a batch of rendered images, and we're going to try to make them aligned in distribution. Um, what does it mean in distribution? We basically take a feature extractor, extract all these images uh, on either real scenes or synthetic scenes, and then try to match in that feature space, uh, something called maximum mean discrepancy, right? So here, so far, we haven't used any single label. This is just by, by comparing uh, images by themselves. Now, you, you can go even smarter and say, hey, let me label a little bit of data and see whether I can actually personalizes data synthesis such that if I train a network on my synthesized data set, it's actually going to do the best possible job on that small annotated uh, validation set. Right? So I can actually optimize my data such that the perform downstream performance of whatever model I'm going to be training is going to be somehow maximized. Right? And what we're going to do here is fine tuning of this graph neural net. So we're not doing anything you know, more special here, just again, transforming these attributes such that when you render now maybe a, a larger batch of data and I train a neural net on top, either object detector or segmentation or whatever, um, I'm going to maximize my performance on this real label data set, which could be very small because I just need a sample of the, of the accuracy. Okay, and this needs to be trained with RL because this is a non-differentiable objective. Cool, so, so far we have basically been learning just the distribution. So this allows us to basically just learn the distribution of these attributes. Right now, the real challenge is, can we learn the structure too? Right, can we have the simulator be completely learned? Right, when I go to Tokyo, I just wanna hand it off, collect some real footage and everything is being learned. There's no more artist or engineer in the loop. Um, so here, basically, on top of what we've done before, we also want to learn structures, okay? The, basically, the probabilities of how many cars, how many lanes I should have. Um, and the way we're going to do this is using a probabilistic context-free grammar, right? So uh, a context-free grammar basically means you have, um, you have symbols and you have rules that tells you how to expand each symbol until you basically hit a terminal symbol and that's kind of um, composing your string. So essentially what we wanna learn is a generative models of string 
strings constrained by your grammar. Okay, so here I have a bunch of symbol, symbols, and uh, I don't know whether you see my mouse cursor, and, and the rules that tells you how this symbol is being expanded. Okay, and you know, if, if you now take like one particular sample from this uh, context for grammar, you, you can convert it into a tree again, and maybe sample the attributes, which we already know how to do from the previous project, and then you can get an image out. That's roughly the idea, right? Of course, we want to learn the probabilities behind this pro-list grammar, and that's the tough part. So basically what we're going to do here, we're going to have an autoregressive model, which is taking some latent vector, okay? And we're going to map that latent vector into unnormalized probabilities of the sampling rules. And because you know the previous symbol you have sampled, now you know which rules are actually possible. Right, and you can mask them out. Okay, and again, you can you can sample the rule that maybe has the highest or whatever with some probability you sample the rule. Okay, and then you add that to uh, to the list, and then you feed that back into this autoregressive model and repeat. Okay, until you basically hit all the terminal symbols. Okay, now of course this is now much harder because now I'm making discrete decisions. And the only way I can really possibly train this is using RL, reinforcement learning. And obviously, there's a lot of bells and whistles. You know, if you guys have questions, I can answer late, later. But we kind of managed to train this system with RL. OK, again, comparing uh, kind of distribution of images to the real data. No, no labels used at all. OK, so here are some results. On the right side, I'm showing you know, some real samples of images from a real data set, I guess here in taken in Germany. On the left is like a really badly initialized probabilistic grammar. Someone just kind of wrote initialization for the, for the probabilities. So you can see like there's almost no cars, no buildings, basically nothing, the scenes are empty. And in the middle is after training. So these are actually samples from our model, which learns now both the structure as well as the attributes of, of each of the objects. Okay, uh, I was super surprised how well this works, given that we have not used a single single label of examples. Okay, so here one way to, to look at the performance or evaluate how well we're doing is look at the histograms of you know cars objects. So here the dark green would be you know distribution of uh, the number of cars in the real data set, and then the the orange would be the prior. So you can see that there's a high peak with very few cars in the scene. And after training, you get this lime color, and it's almost perfectly matching the distribution that you observe in Kitty. I was I was really kind of shocked by how well this works, given that there is no no labels. Okay. Now, of course, you're gonna tell me it's it's very easy to write this grammar by hand. I mean, you're just placing a bunch of cars and people. Uh, my argument is that you know if you can do this without any any label, you know. I just want to see how far you can push this, right? How, how, how rich we can actually make this grammar to the point where maybe a human would not even be able to, to tune all these parameters. But we are not there yet. Um, another way to kind of evaluate your data is, is really kind of the value of data, uh, meaning that we, we are rendering images, we're rendering ground truth, you know, whatever ground truth we decide. We're actually training some neural network for some task on that model and then evaluating performance on the final real data set. And then you can see whether your generated data was actually improving the, that, that downstream performance, uh, which turns out to be the case um, for, for basically learning each part of the mo model. Great, so this is showing what's happening during training. So the first frame is just like the initial sample from the grammar. Every other frame is basically the, this model trying to modify the scene such that they're more and more realistic. And you can see how quickly it gets it, how quickly it rotates the currents in the right way and position them you know, aligned with the, with the lanes and, and pushing the people closer to the camera and so on. And of course, this is a generative model, right? which means that you, you can push this as far as you want. You can generate tons of scenes. All of them come labeled. Any type of label 
segmentation, detection, optical flow, everything just comes out of the render, which is where the, the real power of synthetic data is. All right, now, now you're gonna say, you know, this is all procedural models, so someone has to go and write all those rules. Can we actually do this without that? Can we just learn directly from data and generate these worlds? Okay, so we had this very simple attempt in generating road layouts, which kind of, you know, is the base of a, of a city, right? So the goal would be, can you actually just, just have a generative model that's gonna create good looking road layouts? But not just that, can I have it conditional style? Can I say, okay, this part needs to be like Cambridge, this part needs to look like New York, and then condition on that, I wanna generate, you know, the rest of the city. And maybe even use that model for parsing. Okay, so the way we're gonna frame this is a graph generation, right? Where the nodes are the control, control points on the roads, right? And two nodes being, being connected is basically like a straight line segment, straight road segment between the points. Okay, so the real problem is I wanna generate a graph with attributes, right? So control points having X, Y, which means the location inside the city. Okay, and we had a very simple model to do this, right? Where we're gonna generate this graph iteratively. Uh, I don't know whether you're familiar with Yure's work actually on graph RNNs, um, where we have a version here, but it's also generating attributes, which, which in this case would be X, Y locations of the points. Um, so you're ge we're generating iteratively at each point, you're taking one point from the queue uh, and encoding information only locally. So we're taking paths that lead into this point, all the paths of some length n, whatever n, I think we use like n is four or five. So we're only interested in kind of the local neighborhood of this point that we have already generated so far. And then we're decoding the remaining set of neighbors, uh, the remaining points to which this point is being connected. Okay, and then you take this point off of the queue and then add these guys to the queue. And you stop basically when you don't have any more neighbors to generate or where you hit kind of the bounds of the city that you decide on uh, at the, at the get-go. And these are all just RNNs, very simple model. Uh, Sonia, yeah. but, but the procedure you suggested would generate trees, uh, but road segment, road networks are not trees. Yeah, yeah, no, no, we have some post process because you can actually, uh, you can actually close this, right? You can, you can, so if two points are being closed, we just close them together. That's what you mean? Uh, no, I meant, how do you generate a cycle? Because it seems that you always create new, new nodes and connect them to your current current point. But how do you generate a triangle or a cycle? That's a question. So, so, so in this case, like if this node could still be generating some neighbors, right? So it could generate a point that is very close by to this, this point, And we would just make that one point. It's a post-processing step, so that would create a cycle. Oh, I see. Because every every inter every point has a spatial location, and because you are generating spatial locations, right. you can then merge spatially. Yeah, yeah you points. merge. That's right. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. All right. So some results here. Again, maybe there's a prettier way to do it. That was just our our way. Um, so here we're conditioning on different cities, like style of the city. You can train a, a model basically per city or have a code that is embedding the, the city uh, identity. Here you can anchor and say this part should be like some part of the city, the other one should be the other part of the city and you just feed that as an additional attribute to the RNN. And you can also use it for aerial image uh, parsing, so road parsing from error images. I'm not going to talk about details, but this model can essentially be used as a prior for, for estimating road geometry. And of course, you know, once you have this road generating network, you know, that means that, you know, you kind of have a city of some sorts, at least you have the road. And now maybe the next step would be procedural model or maybe even learning where to place buildings and other elements of the city. Cool. So the question that remains is that what about objects? So we know now how to place elements. So we now maybe know how to place the static elements of the city, but you know, the artist would still need to 
be uh, creating the individual assets, let's say cars or buildings and so on. Right, um, so maybe we can do something about that as well. Maybe we can allow people to just take a picture and turn them into a 3D, uh, possibly animatable model, okay? And my goal is, can we, can we do that just training from single images? Can we just scrape the web, cars or birds or whatever class we want, and learn from those images to generate 3D high quality assets? Okay, so the problem is when I have an image's input and output a mesh with 3D vertices and faces, plus maybe some other attributes like texture, material, anything that allows us to actually render this uh, asset. Okay, and to solve this problem, we're going to turn to graphics actually, because in graphics, we know that images are formed by geometry interacting with light, right? Which means that if I have geometry like a mesh, I have lighting, of texture, maybe a material map. Uh, I can fit this into a graphics renderer and I'm getting out a rendered image, right? And you can think of computer vision as going the opposite way. Computer vision means I'm taking an image and trying to go back to the mesh light and you know these geometric properties, okay? So now if we make this differentiable, then suddenly this entire rendering process opens up to, the, to machine learning. What does this mean, right? I can take an image, I wanna train a neural net that's gonna produce these 3D properties, right? And I wanna avoid having 3D supervision, like a loss on these elements because I simply don't have 3D for this particular image. But I wanna, I wanna have this, I wanna throw these predictions into a render. It's gonna produce an image and I wanna define my loss on the actual output image. Right, I basically want the rendered image to look like the input image, okay? Now to make this work, it's not as easy as just saying, this is gonna work because I can just produce a flat, flat mesh, right? And that will perfectly satisfy this. So typically what people do is, is use multiple views of the same object um, during training. And that's one way to actually ensure that the 3D prediction is consistent across those different views. Okay. Now, coming back to that desire of mine of not even needing multi-view data, but here I still need multi-view data. So the question is, can we be even smarter than this? Can we somehow get away of needing multi-view data? Okay. And what we did was looking at generative models. Okay, so these images here are fake. They're fake, they're, they're generated by StyleGAN, which is basically, a, again, uh, a generative model of, of images, okay? And all these are just sampled from, from, this, from this generative model. Okay, and it has a particular st structure like this. It has some later code and it maps it into what calls like style layers that go into like a specially designed in kind of a, a progressive architecture that finally outputs an image. Okay, and it turns out that particular codes at the various levels actually have some disentanglement and have some uh, some controllability. Let me let me let me expand on that. So it turns out that if you mess and try to kind of analyze these different codes, you can find one part of that of that latent code where you can vary the viewpoint code. So part of that code and keep the remaining, which we're gonna call content code frozen uh, and sample basically by just, you know, varying the viewpoint code and you get, you know, almost identical car, but in different viewpoints. Okay, so all we're taking is this trained generative model and just mess, mess with what it has already learned. Okay. Um, kind of opposite, if I vary content code, which is gonna be here across different uh, rows, uh, but keep viewpoint code fixed, which is in each individual column. Each individual column means a fixed viewpoint code. I can get different cars rendered, you know, rendered, generated, um, uh, but with different, so different cars in the same viewpoint, okay? And this is, this is precisely what we want. This is like a neural renderer. Right, so basically StyleGAN has learned to be a graphics renderer of sorts. It understands 3D 
you know, it understands that, you know, this something is identity and you can vary viewpoint coin, it's gonna just render stuff in different viewpoints. Um, and that's precisely the data we need. Okay, what does that mean? Suddenly the world of opportunities opens up, right? I just download images uh, from the web, I train style again, and now I have a multi-view data generator and I can feed it into my differentiable rendering pipeline and everything works out. So these are just a couple of results for birds here. Uh, we also did it for cars. Um, so what I'm showing on the left is the original input image. This is the prediction. Uh, for the geometry and texture rendering the same viewpoint. And this is just to convince you that 3D is actually good. So it's re-rendering that prediction in different viewpoints. Um, so it looks pretty good. And of course, I mean, this is, you now have a train network, right? You can just feed it images and get out assets that are not perfect yet, but they look pretty, pretty damn good. So let me just show you a little demo here. Um, this is software called Omniverse that NVIDIA is uh, developing but basically the demo is you know the user would upload a photo and you get out um like a good looking 3d asset pay attention that actually the materials are correct so you get these shiny metal reflections and the windshields i'm not sure whether you can see it but they're kind of transparent and really the key to do that is to, to also predict part segmentation. I didn't talk about how we do that, but that's another uh, cool trick, uh, not yet published, um, that basically allows us to swap over the materials with a part uh, label, right? So if I predict something is a part, uh, is, a, is a body of the car, I can just use met metal and, and render that correctly. Okay, so at the heart of that was basically being able to just take these images and predict 3D models. But we'd also have this method that can do um, really detailed segmentation of objects, um, right? So for cars, we take this input image and then we also do detailed segmentation of all the parts. So you get every uh, light, you get the license plate, you even get the door handles and so on. And we predict that into 3D. And once this is in 3D, now you can use it to to animate things, right? I can take this and replace a tire with a real animatable tire. I can make blinkers go on and so on. So I think this part segmentation is really good. Okay, well, right now we're in the process of doing the same thing for faces, right? And as you see, this is actually working really well. Again, you can get like the gaze of the person, the blinking teeth and so on. The really cool part here, unfortunately, I cannot talk about it yet because it's not out yet. We can pull this kind of segmentation off with just 16 labeled examples. Okay, so only 16 images need to be labeled with this level of detail, which actually takes one hour per object to label just because it has so many details. But we only need 16 examples. I think that's really, really great. And it's gonna enable so many applications, uh, AR being, or VR being one of them. I think I'm out of time though, uh, Jure. So I don't know whether I should stop here or not. Um, uh, yeah, it's great. If you, if you want uh, five, uh, five more minutes, I give you five more minutes. <laughs> okay, sure. Um, all right, so maybe I switch uh, gears a little, let's skip this. But basically the next step, this was all 3D uh, and 3D static assets, you know, the world and the, like the different components. Obviously the world is not static and we need to be able to animate it, right? And animation means um, both motion, right? So I want to be able to go from a video to a really good 3D animation that's going to look realistic. Um, so in this case, what we are doing is, you know, taking this noisy prediction of a 3D pose tracker, and we are kind of fitting like a physically plausible um, 3D body trajectory where we assume we know body dynamics. And you can see that these predictions are really good. Okay, so basically the whole piece, we're gonna be able to take all the available video footage of people and be able to kind of animate them. Okay, so at least we know how to synthesize motion. Of course, the holy grail is to model behavior as well. Right, and, and this, is, this is really kind of the, one of the most exciting things for me. Like how, how can I model not just you know, animation, not just motion, but actually the behavior. And human behavior is so 
complicated, right? Like, uh, you know, how you behave with your family is so different than how you behave with your friends in the work setting, whether you're in a wedding, whether you're just home watching TV, whether you're in pain, whether you're just woke up, you know, your behavior is going to be very different. Every person is going to be very different. And kind of being able to capture that is, is to me, is like the holy grail. It's just like a very, very challenging problem. And for the purpose of, of this, understanding behavior and eventually synthesizing it, you know, we created uh, movie graphs, um, where basically we're going to chop up the movie into different scenes, uh, different coherent scenes, and we're going to label it with what I think is very informative about that scene, which means a situation, in this case, will be bullying, scene, you know, where the things is happening, but also a graph that really tells you more details about the scene. Right, in this case, you have a bunch of characters. They might have certain attributes. Um, you know, they might be interacting in certain ways. Um, and then also relationships between different characters, which can you know, start or end. And we actually annotate whether a relationship has just started or ended, um, and so on. So you, 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 we basically wanted to have a really rich graph that distills the entire video clip into kind of this compact format. Okay. Um, and everything is time stamped into video. Okay. And we basically went and we annotated 50 movies, so 7,000 clips, which was an adventure in its own because it's very hard to get annotators um, even agree or, or even annotate this kind of information. But I think this data is amazing because, you know, a movie is like a trailer of your life. Right, the characters meet, the characters fall in love, it does something complicated. It's like it really kind of puts you through all these realistic situations that people find themselves in. And I think just analyzing that data and learning from that data is, is, is really amazing. Uh, we kind of stopped working on this direction just because the data is such a bottleneck, it has copyright and so on. We cannot release it. So if anyone is from Amazon or something, please, please ping me because I would love to collaborate and push this to be more uh, on, on a larger scale. Um, all right, so now what you can do is start analyzing this data and there's a lot of social common sense that emerges by just looking at correlations between, you know, interaction situation, right? So in robbery, you know, I typically have, you know, threatening but less so agreeing, uh, wedding, people typically agree and dance and, you know, between emotions and relationships, you know, enemies are typically violent or scared. Uh, so I think this is really cool. And of course, you can also look at things across domains. And you, you know, you can do all sorts of different tasks with this kind of data. Uh, you know, what we kind of uh, pursued was graph-based retrieval. If instead of natural language, a user could just draw a little graph and said, oh, I want two different characters, one of them scared, one of them a kid, and so on. Find me relevant clips in the movies. But you can do also sorts of like, uh, um, these common sense predictions, such as, you know, take away certain parts of the graph and say, can you reorder which interaction happened first, which one happened second, right? And that just really means if, you're, if your neural networks are learning something about, um, you know, social interactions uh, and so on. So this is just a very quick uh, maybe demo here for video retrieval where the query would be, I want a situation like that happening in a church want to have two different characters, one female, one male, one regretful, one confused. Um, and then, you know, we would be looking for relevant scenes here. And they're really kind of, it's a graph matching problem. We're turning each video into a graph as well. We're refining people across the video saying, this is, you know, Tom Cruise character, I forgot what was his name, um, and inferring all these different attributes. And then it's just a graph matching problem, which can be done really quickly. Um, I just wanted to mention this like one tiny last thing, which I'm really excited about, which is a collaboration with Mohammed. Um, we have started annotating more stuff on top of those graphs because those graphs are things that you could almost animate in animation software, almost, because you know which are the characters and what they're doing, right? And there's maybe some software that can take a character and if you say it's walking, you should be able to animate. The only thing missing is kind of the 3D information where this, characters actually are with respect to each other and where their gaze is. So Mohammed hired a movie, um, movie student uh, and he went and annotated 
uh, you know, camera. Here is a black circle where it's pointing, and then where the characters are in bird's eye view, and how they're kind of looking at each other. So we annotate quite a few movies with this kind of information. And now you can do cool stuff because now you can do, you know, you can take a movie clip, something like this Forrest Gump, and, and turn it into animation. This is all ground truth now, but you could imagine training a neuron lead that basically goes from clips into this kind of spatial and semantic graphs and reanimate um, movies. Here's another example. She said Obviously, like no physics, so this shoes. is all right, like super open your eyes, not man. great. Um, but you get a kind of a, a sense of the match of the two different scenes. Let's take a little walk around. And really kind of the exciting part for me here is if you're able to animate these scenes, then you can start training some generative feel. models um, to synthesize behaviors, right? Yeah, and you can also train some uh, models to understand behavior. Ever seen. Cool. And I'm gonna skip all this stuff and just, uh, you know, stop and kind of summarize. Uh, you know, there's kind of two sides of me. One, at U of T, we're really interested in this uh, enabling really fast notation with self-supervised learning and just kind of uh, you know, interactive methods. And it's, I have a 3D side as well that's basically trying to marry computer vision and graphics and machine learning. And where we want to build uh, the same kind of interactive AI tools, but for 3D. Um, and you know, this is just the beginning. I think there's so many exciting problems to, to be solved. So, you know, I'm always looking for collaborations. So if anyone is interested, please, please email me and I'll stop here. Yeah, uh, thank you, Sanya. This was great. Uh, it was uh, awesome to see this vision of basically taking, uh, taking uh, images and creating these uh, structured representations of, uh, of, the underlying, uh, of the underlying image or the domain and then uh, kind of thinking about synthesis or uh, graphics as you, as you call it. So this is super cool. Um, I there are a couple of questions I wanted to go, um, to go over that, was, that were asked uh, by the audience. Um, the first one was that uh, for the labeling part that you showed us, um, the image labeling, people were asking how, how is that done? Um, you know, is there some kind of convex hull fitting in the background after the model inference is done? Can you perhaps talk a bit about how do you do it in practice? Uh, you know, is there any limit on the polygon size? Uh, things like that. If there's any fitting? What was the... Uh, how are you do the fitting? How do you take the input? Is there an oh, RNA in the background well, doing this? We are directly predicting the polygon. Polygon RNN, which is our first method. We have a bunch of different methods and really we go from image into a polygon. It assumes they have a fixed number of points. Right now 40 and then we have refinement, which is basically adding points and moving points around such that, you know, you snap into edges and that's all like a learned function. Um, what was the other question? Uh, the other question was, uh, have you thought about uh, extending this to three dimensional models? The, the labeling part? Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. We have already a model. So what, you, what I was demoing is the interface being like way behind the tech. So we have 3D, we have video and uh, you know, all that is going to be done soon. We just have one software engineer basically building out the software. Um, but, but yeah, yeah, definitely thinking about it and definitely we're working on all of this. Um, super. So this was a, que uh, a questions, clarification questions for the first part. For the uh, second part, uh, uh, people were wondering uh, how is uh, the synthesis performed over the over the grammars and the uh, and the real uh, real scenes, and also how are the probabilities assigned to uh, features or objects? So could you kind of elaborate on the methodology in the in uh, in that part of the talk? Yeah, yeah. So we're relying on this context-free grammar, right? So those probabilities are learned, right? I was talking about that, uh, you know, you basically have a latent code and you have an RNN that's basically predicting the probabilities of the sampling rules. It's telling, you know, which rule you should be sampling. And it's a generative model, right? And the way you're training is, is, is with, with RL. Um, so there, there's not, you know, there's no human in the loop per se. Uh, you just need to have some decent initialization, I guess. But 
it's all just learning those probabilities. And it's actually not really a context-free grammar in a sense that you have this RNN that's kind of decoding your history. So it can, it can model actually a little bit of context. Uh, super. And then uh, in uh, the same part of the talk, um, uh, you showed us a bit of, about evaluation, but can you, could you say more? How, how do you evaluate results uh, given that you're not using labels? Yeah, yeah. So the way that we're uh, evaluating right now is basically the goal that I'm pursuing is how useful is this synthesized data for downstream tasks? Right, which means that imagine I want to do object detection, I want to do segmentation, I want to do planning, whatever people want to do with this data. I can render ground truth on top of just images. And I can train some neural networks on the loop on that synthesized data, and I can evaluate it on you know some some small part of the data I have actually labeled. Right. And now I can I could compare to the value of the data of the baseline, right? Someone doing everything by hand versus this learned synthesize synthesized data right and hopefully that final end performance on the real data gets improved uh do you have a sense because this seems kind of a very cheap uh or you know very clever way to pre-train big models that then you could fine tune on your uh, hand labeled uh, precious uh, data um do you have any uh, sense of uh, i don't know how well how well does this transfer over how little data do you need for fine tuning yeah, I mean, in the end, you cannot not have real data, particularly for something like self-driving, which is really a domain where you want that last bit of performance, you need to have a lot of real data. And really the key is to have good domain adaptation methods, right? Because the synthetic data, no matter how hard you try, is still going to look different than the real data, right? So you need, you need, you know, I guess it depends on the, the application where you need that real data to um, either fine tune or mix Right, the way you can think about it is you have a lot of real data, but you're mixing synthetic data as well, right? Or have some really good domain adaptation methods. Uh, another way to look at it is that you can use a synthetic data to generate hard cases, right? Imagine that in, in driving or in indoor robotics, I have never recorded some accident or some, you know, a, a turtle going across the street. You can do that in, in synthetic worlds, right? So you wanna have some way of, uh, of mixing that in. Um, so I don't have a, you know, an answer of how much real data you need. I think, you know, for this application, you just need a lot, but this is one good way to uh, maybe minimize that, that amount. Uh, super cool. Probably and then I guess one, one uh, question uh, that's uh, easy to answer is uh, this inverse uh, image method that you discussed, uh, you know, can it only generate 2D images or can it actually output 3D content? Oh, it generates 3D, that was the full purpose, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Super. And then the last question is: uh, the, Is neural turtle uh, restricted to line segments like road, uh, or can we generate polygon like uh, buildings or or land covers using the same algorithm? I think there is nothing really preventing it potentially. But right now we were just doing road segments. Um, you know, it's the graph generation. The tricky part with buildings would be, of course, they're closed. It's a closed polygon, which is not something we're imposing here. Um, but that maybe our polygon RNN method would address. Um, so right now we were just generating road layout. We were also trying to generate building footprints condition on that, but we didn't like push it hard enough for me to show results. Um, uh, super, thank you. And then a very important question goes last, which is uh, um, what parts of this is open source and where can it be downloaded or uh, you know, what's the Google query or how do people get to use this uh, super method? Most of the stuff is, is actually online. So you guys can check the, the code for the annotation suite is not going to be online, but the web service is going to be uh, available. So you guys can send me emails or there's a web page where you can sign up for early access. The main bottleneck right now is just GPUs. We kind of just open it for the public. Uh, all the other projects, most of the code is online. Some of it um, MIT license, so you guys can play with it. Um, I don't know whether I want me to share slides and put links, but if you Google search, most of the code is online. Uh, super. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, this was great. Um, we are um, very excited and, and uh, to, to have you, Sanya. It was a great talk. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, to everyone. Yeah, thank you. 
for everyone else, um, we are doing this uh, once a month. Uh, so uh, stay tuned uh, for the next talk that will happen uh, uh, at the second half of uh, March. Uh, we are going to announce it and hope that uh, everyone who was able to attend today comes to the future seminars as well. So uh, thanks a lot for attending. And uh, thanks again, Sanya. Thank you. Thank you, Jure. Thank you, guys. Bye, guys. Bye.